Uh, now I would like to, from a, th a great thinker, I would pass uh, thinker and maker because Giovanni also did a lot of very, very strong and beautiful buildings. I will uh, now pass to uh, a maker, uh, Lorenzo Lucena. He is an alchemist of senses, working with brands for the last 25 years. He has created a sensorial branding program approach that helps brands to have a more emotional branding territory. Besides that, he is a perfume composer and the only Portuguese member of Société Française des Parfumeurs. Actually, Lorenzo has just la launched his la latest creation, Aqua di Portocali, a eau de parfum inspired in Portugal. And he also organizes workshops, masterclasses, and sentient dinners inspired in cities, countries, people, or even emotions. So tell us, Lorenzo, does the future smell good? Thank you, Diogo. Good morning. Well, I, I don't know if the future will smell good, but I think uh, mostly I think it, it, depends, on, it depends on us. Uh, but first, I would like to thank you for the invitation and being among you this morning. Um, and just for a, a quick uh, introduction, I would like to say, uh, to refer, refer a, a number that is particularly important for my life, not as a perfume composer, but working with brands and senses and so on. That is 80% of our, our daily acts are non-conscious. And uh, when we think about leaving the city, living with the other humans uh, every day, um, it puts us thinking in having this in mind, why are we doing with our senses? Because we use mostly the visual sense and the other th senses, the other, the other four senses uh, are used in like 15 or 17%. So it's time to start using again our senses as we have used before, because that will make a huge difference in our daily living. Um, I think we, we have to be more sensorial, more intuitive, because intuition is, at the end, is, is a collection of experience that we have, we are collecting along our life. So, I, I, I think that this is really important to our uh, daily living experience. And um, in the other side, as Charles has referred in his brilliant introduction, um, cities are losing their identity. They are being massificated. Uh, they are losing their smells. I'm sure that we all are aware of the small things that we had in our childhood and in our neighborhoods where we used to live and the smells that we had at that time and the smells that are there in our days. And for sure, some small coffee factories that we had, for instance, in Lisbon, we have more than 20 small coffee factories along the city and now I think we, we only have one or two. And the coffee is just a, a reference. Uh, we all have much more, uh, um, as I said, a massificated ambi ambience. Of course, regarding the smells and the sounds, um, and the cities are changing because five years ago we didn't have the 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 bells of the bikes. So there's something, also some things that are happening now that are quite nice. It's nice to hear the, the sound of a ting-ting of a bike. It's not the ding-ding of a tuk-tuk, of course, because we are all uh, uh, sad, probably, or a bit sad, with the proliferation of these new species that are coming to our cities. But um, I would say that we, we, we have to be much more aware of our senses, and especially about our smells, because cities are completely different. If we think about smells of Lisbon, or Porto, or Obidos, or Paris, they are 
of course, different. We start to remember in Lisbon, and we have, of course, the first uh, approach. I like the sweet basil, you know, majerico, of course. We have the carnation flower, the cravo, uh, of course, associated to 25 de Abril, to the revolution, revolution period. Probably we will have some carnation flowers in this room, in these billboards. Um, but then we have the, the oil of the trams, the, the oil of the electrics, the, the oil that they launch to, to have traction in the, when they climb the, the hills. They have to, to launch oil and the sand so that the, the wheels get traction to just start, just continue going. And we have also the, the, the smells of Bertrand. It's the oldest bookstore in the world. We have the, the sea mist of Teju. Of course, when, uh, when the mare is high, because when it's low, it's really bad smell. So, and I, I could keep following talking about smells of Lisbon as we can find smells in Oporto and Paris or Obidus or no matter what, where. So I think it's, it's really important to have these, these, these layers, you know, this olfactive layer in our daily living experience because, of course, we are always in a rush. We are always trying to, to get somewhere faster because we have a meeting, we have to pick our kids in the school, we have to go to the supermarket and then arriving home making the dinner. But when I have my master classes or my scented dinners that uh, are very nice to moments to put people talking about uh, smells and the cities and giving people a moment of understanding that they are losing a lot of things in their, in their daily life. Because if we start using our senses again, probably we will find some magic and some nice uh, experiences. So, um, just for a start, I would not take longer. Uh, my main message is like, let's try to use again, step by step, our senses. Because if we start smelling, uh, as Charles was talking about, about his experience, of course we are not walking around like <laughs> all the time, but, um, but usually when I'm giving a master class and I give people smelling like banana or apple, 65 or 70 percent of the people, they don't identify the smell of the banana of the, or the, the apple if I'm not showing the, the object. If I'm not, if I'm just covering their eyes, they will not identify the smell of a banana. Come on. We all eat bananas. We all know the smell. We all know that kind of smells, but we are really sleeping in, with, in, our, with, in our senses. So, that's why I, uh, I'm all the time pushing and putting, trying to put people smelling again. You know, it's not, it's not embarrassing smelling the plate before eating it. Of course, we, we are not putting our nose in the, in the food. But why not giving like 10 seconds smelling to the things? Unless you are drinking the wine, of course, we all are. Wine experts, you know, just put the, the, the glass doing this and smelling and put in the mouth. And, but why don't we start making some theater too, as we do with wines, probably because the majority of the people all do the same things with the, with the glass of the wine, but they are not aware of what they have to do with the, with the wine at the end. They just know that they, they want to drink it. Um, it would be nice to start using again our sense of smell and our sense of sound because cities are full of very nice sounds, very invisible sounds, and that is the magical of life. Thank you. Thank you, Lorenz for talking about smells and uh, letting now us going to João Seixas, who is a geographer and economist, professor at the University of Lisbon, 
graduated from the London School of Economics and the Autonomous University of Barcelona. So you probably have already filled a lot of smells in those two cities, different. And he's also a consultant to the European Commission and the Municipality of Lisbon. He has several books published and he's the member of the board of a bookshop called Lear Devagar, Read Slow. So, João, can you, what can you tell us about the revolution of the senses? Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry. Oops. The American way. <laughs> good morning to you all. Good morning to the, my fellowships of the table. Uh, I don't have any presentation. I thought, and it's right, this would be a Sunday conversation. And it is, actually. And so I didn't prepare exactly uh, a wire of narrative about this, but I listened to the previous discussion. So I had, and fortunately, I had made a presentation four days ago in Porto about the happy city. And they wanted me to reflect a little bit about the happy city. So I have my paper here about the, the happy city reflections. So I made some. Uh, adaptations to what I've heard very interestingly, if you don't mind. Um, in, talking with uh, Joanny and with Charles before the, this uh, presentation to start, I realized that we are all more or less, at least we here, and also Lorenzo for sure, in this perfume management, looking for something similar. Uh, not the thing, not a specific destiny, but uh, the ways of understanding the new world and adapting to the new needs and new uh, desires of justice and happiness and progress that we need. Thinking as a basis of my small presentation here, what Joanny said about the fundamental conjunction of belief, knowledge, and emotion uh, and with science and art, but especially the three ones I like very much, belief, knowledge, and emotion. And uh, also with the other part, in the other column, what Charles Landry explained about the city as a drama, which is a very good uh, visioning, a very good uh, landscape to understand the city. Uh, and what you said also, the city as a communication device. Okay? I believe that the city is, uh, of course, a communication device, but more than that, it's a, a stage a communication stage, and you are from comedia, so of course you know that. An ongoing uh, drama, not finishing, fortunately. Um, we, as you said, we shape buildings and the buildings shape us. When you said that, I remind me of the phrase of the Borges, the, the Argentinian writer of the architect, who writes the city for decades, and then understands, after all, that in the end, the city is, the, is their own, its own face. It is its own face adapted to the city, and the city adapted to its own face. It's one of those beautiful, among millions of Borges, that I like very much. As a geographer, I understood that more than 10 years ago, 20 years ago, when I was studying the connections between functions, urban functions, that means to live, to have fun, to work, to go to school, etc., and transportation. In the beginning, I thought that transportation was a result of the different functions around the city, around the, the territorial system. Then I realized that it was not exactly like that, that the functions of the city are a result in a certain way, in a very important way, of our mobility, of the way that we want to interconnect with each other. Interconnection is a very strong and fundamental word. I believe that the city started 10,000 10, years ago as places of interconnection, of trade, of commerce, uh, for everything. Goods and services, uh, ideas, uh, emotions, beliefs. Spaces of trade, it's what we are doing here actually. Right? This is a place, an urban place, an urban discussion, even in a rural landscape like this one. Uh, but in that circumstance, I believe that in moments of transition that we are living today, 
because we are living a huge a, a fundamental moment of transition, so important or even more important than the, that compared with the beginning of Industrial Revolution or even with the beginning of the, the press by Gutenberg. The digital era that started 20 years ago, 30 years ago, the first uh, IBM personal computer was sold in 1980. That's a fundamental landscape for us to realize the changes that we're living in. Not only so, uh, uh, I took the, this example of the personal computer to say that my belief as a, for a justice city is not only in special places. It should be in all places, in the most banal places, in the most, not creative neighborhoods only, I'm sure you agree with me, but the most banal, banal, I don't know how to say in English, banal or banal, uh, neighborhoods, which is after all 99% of our life. So to put emotions in 99% of our life, that wouldn't be bad uh, as a political program in my belief. And to say in another form, we have built in the last decades cities for pleasure, places for pleasure. I would prefer places for desire. Desire comes before pleasure in principle. Desire is the motor, is the engine of human uh, emancipation. So to build places for desire would be more fundamental than building places only for pleasure. And then pleasure will come. Sometimes, and sometimes don't, which is good also, which is good for human emancipation. And um, in that way, uh, our issue would be, the future would be more Uxleyan of Aldous Huxley or more Orwellian in, the, in, the, in those senses. So places for, uh, for desire would be important for that. That's one of the things I wrote this morning. I was thinking about that when I thought about the, the happy city. The, the problem is, the, not the only problem, is that with the digital era, we all became very much, and speaking in Portugal, Fernando Pessoas. <laughs> we all have an heteronymous life. In the morning, we might be Alvaro de Campos, in the afternoon, Ricardo Reis, and in the evening, Alberto Queiro. Uh, I don't know if our foreign uh, uh, inviters know about Fernando Pessoa. 100 years ago, he unfold himself in different characters, you know? We are all unfolded, and we will continue to unfold for the future. And it makes, that makes our life very fractal, very confusing. The emails, the connections, the literary festivals, the bookshops, and the, our work, and the children, etc. The, the confusion of our life is a new thing that it doesn't exist in the time of, of our fathers at least with this rhythm, with this pressure. And to find the connection of community, to have the sense of community, to have the sense of desire in each place, it's one of the most fundamental things in the, in the future of urbanism, in the future of the cities, uh, I believe. Um, let me just pass rapidly this, and then I will go on to finish the first uh, ideas. Uh, I like very much, uh, as a social thinker, uh, one very known French sociologist, Alain Touraine. I'm sure you know. Alain Touraine wrote 40 years ago that community makes citizenship. And four years ago, he went to my university and he said, now it's almost in the opposite. It's the citizenship that builds community. It's the way we understand and we work and we act in front of main challenges, including environmental challenges, for a start, that we can con connect with each other. So citizenship makes community. It's not exactly the opposite. Obviously, territory, neighborhoods should build community. But it's the two things together, which is quite interesting in that sense. The point is that how to build a notion of community, the notion of senses, and the notion of desires with this fractal life that we're having. And I believe very much in this sense that we have to work very much in two or three stages, main stages. One of them is the educational system, a fundamental stage that we should start yesterday. But if we didn't start it yesterday, we should start today. 
the education system. Is, we should encourage children and youngsters to critical interpretation of the, of the present world. We should encourage children <clears throat> and adolescents to politics, to ethics, to citizenship, to community. They sh we should encourage them to be rebel, I believe, to be experimentative, to be on the frontier, of course, with ethics, with some form of ethics. And the other part is, it's a fly around here, and the other part is to work, this is the part of the belief, the other part is the science. We have to understand the new urbanism, the new cities, and put in the middle of the equation the senses, of course, including the smell, one of the five fundamental senses, of course. And for that, uh, I believe that the science of cities is still a child, a child today. We don't know almost anything, I believe. That. Uh, I would finish with a uh, very simple uh, reflection. To build those narratives is not going to be easy because you have to change the educational system. Uh, and especially in a, in a digital era that we are, in a fractal world that we are, we are very much lost, so we need uh, very colorful, uh, meaningful, uh, uh, ob objects. That's not easy. That's, not, that's why in educational terms must be the fundamental pillar. Uh, for instance, the, the, the Jean Baudrillard told about the simulacres that we have. Oh, Lisbon is wonderful. Of course it is. But you have seen only the city center. Do you know Amadora or Pinal Novo or Monte Brown? That's Lisbon too. We have to try to understand the old system, the old thing, the old person. Uh, uh, to develop wide-range narratives for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ron. Very interesting. And uh, uh, before passing the word to uh, the, the rest of the audience, uh, and while you think about a good question for this uh, panel. I, I was thinking about the words I've heard here today and uh, also looking at around me and around the, the room where we are, we see a lot of boards, boards with a lot of strong messages the, uh, saying build a free country, we want to re respond, we want to do this. So a lot of utopias, uh, most of these boards, uh, and we were talking yesterday evening about the lack of utopias nowadays. Somehow uh, all the utopias that uh, were uh, presented to us around the 60s and 70s and ended around that time, and they were not, uh, finally they, they didn't uh, solve our problems, maybe th this problem of desire that João was uh, talking about. Maybe because these utopias were not considering the wholeness and just parts of a reality. And I, th uh, I was thinking that maybe uh, the problem we have to face and the potential that we have with the senses is the possibility of an integration. Uh, an integration of desire and of uh, individual desire in a, com in a communal sense. And that, would this be possible with the senses and how could this be done? This is a, a question that I would like our panel to answer, please. Can we start? Shwani or Charles, maybe? Um, I mean, obviously, as everybody knows, we're in the midst of redesigning the world and all its systems, economically, socially, culturally, politically, and, and so on. And in times of mass transformation, there is always a combination of a sense of confusion and liberation 
before a coherent view comes together in some way. Obviously, there are other bigger issues that are more frightening in this particular uh, tr transformation. And I think that what this discussion about the senses is about is really to try to come back to the fundamentals because it's too easy to go to belief. It's too easy in some sense to say, what is the evidence of what you're doing? And so many things, I think, that become unexpected, Brexit, for example, is because one, because one hasn't understood the emotional life of all of those who said leave. Had there been a greater understanding of that emotional life, and we widened it to include the smells and all of these things, which is part of that emotional life, then you're a bit lost. Uh, you're a bit lost in the forest that you were talking about. Um, and so I think what this, the reason for the emergence of these questions that we're discussing here is a desire to re-anchor oneself, to be anchored against, again in that that is fundamental from which you can build then the, the, these other things, whether one calls them utopias or what is perhaps not ultimately the most important thing. I think the question you just raised about the difference uh, where you said desire, I think that's very important. But another word I like is ambition, because I think that, the, 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 that in the confusion or stroke liberation that we're finding, one needs to have the ambition to create the desire, to create a picture, a story of what could be. And too many of the stories politically that we see are simple reactions too often. And I think we're trying to do, we, whoever the we is, is trying to slowly build this other possible story of what could, could be there, which precisely, rather like your quote of Alvo, Alto, tries to combine these complex differences. And I think the difficulty is, there's a difference, as you know, between complicated and complex, is people who are being so scientific are always actually just treating things complicated as sending someone to the moon because there's a logical sequence, there's physics and so on. Complex is iterative. I do something, it then reacts. It reacts back again, rather like bringing up a child. And in order to understand complexity, we need to operate with the full repertoire of what we have. And I think, sorry, I'm speaking too long, we are discussing the full repertoire of what we have as the foundational basis. Thank you. Uh, I think we, our culture altogether has a very problematic relationship with the, uh, uh, with, uh, the human body. On one hand, uh, the body is uh, uh, strongly uh, eroticized uh, as part of persona and identity uh, and it is, uh, you know, manipulated through fashion and uh, commercial products. But uh, the role of our body in our being humans uh, and the fact that uh, there is no thought without uh, a layer of emotion uh, related with that. So uh, we, we uh, somehow manipulate our notion of the body in one area uh, on, on the surface, but do not accept or understand at all that the body is, is everywhere. It's everywhere. Um, this also comes across in, our, in the understanding of uh, uh, intelligence. The normal understanding uh, is the IQ intelligence, which is a very primitive and one-sided, uh, one-dimensional understanding. There is a book by uh, the American uh, psychologist Gardner where he suggests 10 categories of intelligence in addition to the, to the uh, IQ intelligence. I have myself added uh, at least three uh, categories to Gardner's uh, categories. For instance, um, uh, atmospheric sense is a very important, uh, uh, you know, uh, capacity 
of uh, intelligence, probably existentially the most important one because we have survived because of our un atmospheric understanding of being able to understand really uh, complex environmental situations for survival purposes. Uh, but that is not at all included anywhere in, in the definition of intelligence. As um, um, Edward uh, Wilson, the uh, biophilia biologist, uh, uh, writes, uh, the um, biggest mis problem with mankind is that we don't know who we, who we are and we don't agree what we want to become. I think that's very precisely the problem that we can see in today's political world, for instance, and the, and the f falling apart of uh, structures that we used to believe in. For instance, Nordic uh, social democratic welfare state probably could be argued uh, has been the highest uh, uh, achievement of uh, Western democracy. It's gone. It's gone. Capitalism has, uh, you know, uh, uh, made that idea into a, a past utopia. Um, then when we are thinking of the uh, environmental pro problems, uh, which are almost too late for us to think about when we think uh, we were speaking casually today about the uh, climatic changes, change here and in Finland and everywhere, it's everywhere. Um, so there is a lot of rethinking that we need to, to do and one of them is really uh, understanding ourselves as historical and biological beings. The historicity of uh, humankind, uh, both uh, in terms of human history but uh, particularly biological and evolutionary history, that is completely suppressed from, uh, you know, discussion today. I, I believe very firmly that we need to, to uh, get, get back into discussing and uh, uh, identifying uh, these issues upon which human fate and future can only be, be built. Yes, I, I think we, we have much to be much more uh, sensorial um, uh, and, and, and using, again, our senses in a different way or in a different approach because I have a, a, an example that is not related with cities but it's also related with books and writers. So um, I thought about uh, sharing it with, with you. Uh, like one year and a half ago, I decided to make a surprise to one of the, for me, one, one of the most creative Portuguese language writers, that is Mie Koto. He's, he's a Mozambican writer, and he's one of the guys that l likes the most to, to play with our language. He creates new words, he creates new express expressions, and I'm sure some of you, or the majority of you, knows some of his works. And uh, what I decided was to see uh, his work, so all his books, in an olfactive uh, approach, or with an olfactive lens. So what I've done, I, I was reading his, all his books for some months, and along with that time, I was extracting all the moments where he referred some smell or aroma. Good sometimes and bad in other times. And at the end, the conclusion of all this was that I organized the dinner for Miyakoto and some of his friends in Maputo, or in his house that is around Maputo. And for his surprise, I showed him uh, 12 different aromas that are presented in his books. Uh, some of them are quite common, so they, are, they just appear and are referred very often uh, as his writing also, because he's really 
he repeats a lot of situations and moments and so on. And uh, the experience for all, for the 12 people that were joining us at that dinner was experiencing or getting in touch again with his work only in the olfactive parts. So every time he referred to a smell uh, in a book, they were just reading that part and smelling it also. So I was sharing with the people the 12 smells that are commonly in his writings. And at the end, he was like amazed because he got conscious that he's not an olfactive writer. Okay? And, uh, and, and, and that was super interesting for me because uh, uh, when he, he, he came with me saying goodbye at the end of the dinner, he just told me, well, thank you for this experience because uh, I, I, I'm, I'm really, I'm not uh, an effective writer and I will make my effort in my, new, in my next book to add this layer because it's, it's, it's interesting, it's nice, it's different and at the end in Africa we have a lot of very nice smells that some, if we don't tell to, to the others that will read our books, probably some of them will not even know. So, of course, this is an example of uh, smells and writings and books, but it's a way of uh, sharing with you this, uh, this, this, uh, this, uh, this way of seeing life, this way of experiencing life, this way of uh, getting, being more uh, sensorial in our daily living, our, as I was uh, saying in my first presentation. That's it. Thank you, Lorenzo. Well, very fast narrative before going to the public, probably. Uh, I believe that, uh, well, we are all sons of the rationalistic world. Right? And we, uh, in our uh, lives, have seen the old world that is not coming anymore and we are experiencing some hints of the new world that we have no faintest idea what is going to be like. <laughs> so the fear and the anxiety is quite strong. In that sense, senses are huge. <laughs> the sense of anxiety. Uh, scientists tell us that we know five to seven percent of our brain is, is uh, identifies what we, we know about that. We already know the DNA of our body. We have no idea of the DNA of our communities, of human life. But some ideas we have, of course. Um, and um, if the city is the most complex construction of humanity, is a piece of art, of community piece of art, I would say. So you have the obligation to work also in that, in that part. The problem is that if we know five to seven percent of our brain, of course I'm not going to make any parallelism, it's not science what I'm going to say now, but capitalism is going on, it's getting much more complex and complexified, and at the same time, science itself and technology is also breaking through loads of dimensions. The issue here is that you, you mentioned about the social uh, democratic uh, construction that it's, uh, we needed blood, sweat and tears for 200 years to build it. And now it's on failure. You know? The problem is that in face of technology advancements, huge technology advancements, and huge capitalism advancements with, the, for instance, the intermediated platforms, Uber, Airbnb, etc., this is not becoming democratized. The democratization of the new technologies and the democratization of the new capitalism perspectives and values chains is not becoming still democratized. This is a huge gap that we have to fill. And in those circumstances, I believe very much that, okay, we can talk about senses, but art must be a trigger, 
trigger, and then politics must be the weapon <laughs> uh, to, to to reduce that uh, to reduce that uh, that gap. I, should, I could quote much more, but I suppose I will leave to the public. Then. Thank you. Thank you, João. So now, after this uh, first reflection, I would uh, I would like to know if there if there is any question from the the audience, the public. Boa tarde. Primeiro, eu posso falar em português? Gostaria de pedir licença para falar em português. É, gostaria de agradecer, primeiramente, pela fala dos senhores. É, e fiquei pensando no que o professor João Seixas disse sobre esse caminho para tornar as cidades é, mais felizes. né? Primeiro, uma, cidad uma formação de cidadãos, né? uma cidad da cidadania, para então termos comunidades. Está me ouvindo? Então, e aí, é, e aí o senhor disse sobre a necessidade da educação, né, de, de se reformar, de se repensar o sistema educativo. E me veio um autor é, espanhol, Trilha, que escreve sobre a cidade educativa. Eu gostaria de te perguntar exatamente isso, como que as cidades também educam, né? É, Para além do sistema educativo, como as cidades abraçam as crianças, a nossa, os nossos jovens, de que maneira essas cidades também é, e aí isso desconstrói um pouco essa a cidade já educam é, para quem a quem elas educam com, é, com que objetivo né entende o que eu estou querendo dizer então assim será que é o, o caminho é o sistema educativo mesmo é a pergunta de um dos membros da, da nossa associação é, que está a assistir a, a, a apresentação via vídeo o nome dela é Virginia Saloia uh, Lisbon has been through multiple changes with, uh, with what concerns its inhabitants. For a long time, the house prices have pushed them away from the city centre, making it a ghost city during weekend because most buildings have had offices instead of families. Lately, young families have come back to the city centre, giving it a new life, both to local commerce and to its street life. Tourism, however, seems to be pushing away these new Lisboners. What creative solutions can help to keep these citizens in the city centers within the context of uh, the revolution of the census? Obrigado. Well, I would, for my part, say that um, uh, the position of uh, architecture in most countries is uh, becoming weaker and weaker. I'm particularly speaking from the Nordic uh, perspective where architecture traditionally has had a central role in cultural life and there has been a strong architectural consciousness particularly in my country Finland after the war when the uh, disasters of the war were rebuilt architectural profession was identified with that rebuilding not only the physical uh, part of the uh, nation, but also the mental uh, dimensions of the uh, nation. That has all gone down the drain. Uh, now, nowadays, when uh, construction projects are presented or uh, uh, in, discussed in newspapers, for instance, they are discussed, discussed as uh, as uh, technical uh, functional issues and uh, as investment issues. Uh, the names of the architects are hardly ever mentioned anymore, not to speak of uh, uh, the journals or newspapers having architectural critics. The main uh, newspaper in Finland has one uh, free time architectural critic, which is I would say catastrophic. On the other hand, uh, the question concerning education and children, one of my former students, a lady, established a school for, uh, architecture school for ch children uh, 20 years ago. And it has uh, been, become really uh, impressively successful and uh, that model has spread also internationally we tend to underestimate the capacity of children 
uh, to understand and learn. I had the position in my role as the dean of the architecture school to present a Helsinki center plan by uh, children from five years to uh, 10 years to the Queen of Holland. And uh, I was so proud to show how much uh, uh, children of that age understood about you know, the environments and the potentials in, the, in there. So um, I would turn my eyes on, on education very strongly uh, in this is issue and many others. Uh, well, answering to the, or try to answer to that question. Uh, citizens, citizenship is a moving concept. Uh, 200 years ago, it would be a good citizen if you wouldn't kill the other partner <laughs> before the French Revolution, for instance. And uh, 20 years ago, only 20 years ago, it would be a good citizen to vote in the elections, to be syndicalized in the union, and to have very good... Uh, neighborhoods and to help the neighborhoods, something like that. Today, it's also much more complexified. Uh, uh, even the evaluation of citizenship itself. We, made e we make in our faculty the analysis of the citizenship in Lisbon, whatever that means, and we are trying to understand the actions and the perceptions of people. And if they use the car, if they understand the ecological costs of using the car, if they are part of the school community of their children, if they separate the sewage and the garbage, uh, several issues, if they understand the new urban and ecological issues, etc. Right? And uh, so in that sense, when I thought about the educational system, it was not strict to censor in the, in the classroom. It was an educational and pedagogical with all the different institutions working together, not together, but for opening minds in new, in new directions, in that sense. And in that sense, the, the, the classical scales, the classical geographical scales of uh, cities, not only cities, also here and other places, classical scales of the territories, the neighborhood, the village, the city, the metropolis, etc. we should work it all in all those different scales with all the different networks that community must be developed. This is particularly relevant uh, I say again, in the phase that we are living today with very fractal digital era, and we are all quite lost. So it's quite difficult to understand the guy that is in front of you in the table, so it's even more difficult to understand the other person that's on the si other side of the street. So we, it's a very political sense that we have, have to work very much in the sense of community. With that sense of community, uh, maybe it can be easier to, to, to develop not an utopia, but s several utopias, dialectical utopias, to work in, in each different stages with common principles, uh, but uh, with several utopias. Yeah. Just a brief answer from my perspective to the educational question. Clearly there are wonderful teachers and so on. The question also though, in this dramatic shift, whether the classic teacher is the best teacher, I just leave that there. And I'm just thinking of a series of experiences which you would have to call sensory of understanding the system. And it was done by something called the School of Systems Change. And all the 30 people did was say, how do you understand a system? So we all stood round and then without telling anyone else, we had to make a triangle. And so these people were continually moving around. Nobody knew who you were trying to make a triangle with. All I can tell you, and I'm giving the short version of this game, and there were other games, is I understood a system like I've never understood before because of the way I had to move. Now, if education, firstly, was more playful, you could call that a game, but there were many games we went through, collectively, we at the end didn't have to have long explanations of what a system was because we had actually experienced what a system is in trying to connect with all these other people. In relation to the other question from the video, obviously the overall aim is to bend the market to bigger picture purposes with an ethical base, which is what everybody is beginning to talk about. We understand that. The market on its own can never provide that. We know that once 
turbo capitalism unshackled the old regulatory system, a completely new set of problems have emerged. People call them wicked problems. Wicked problems are problems you have to address even though you do not know the answer. So the question about gentrification and tourism and all of that, and you can see that already, has to have new forms of incentives and regulations. And some people are going to hate this and some people are going to love it. So for example, Amsterdam is reacting dramatically. They've closed their tourism, one of their main tourism promotion departments. They are not advertising the city. They're trying to close down souvenir shops. They're doing a number of things that are incredibly radical, which the hospitality industry won't like, but the citizens will like. So, so there will be more things like that happening because we're needing in this new context of this world, which is the digitized world, which has detached us from place, but also created a different sort of place, i.e. Uh, virtual places as well, that ne needs to be addressed. And therefore, back to education, we need people to be able to explain these movements, and not just to people who are 10, 15, 18, 20, but 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, <laughs> Otherwise, the populist responses and all of that will, will, will get stronger. So my simplistic answer to the question about gentrification and all of that is one was going to have to do some restrictions and they're going to feel fantastic for some people and less so for others, but that'll be fine because there's never 100% agreement on things. Are you happy? to say, Lorenzo, look, you're the sensory guy. You understand more about bloody senses than anyone here. I've been looking at your nose and the way it understands the whole room and atmosphere. Oh, sorry. Sorry, I was just having a private conversation with him. No, I, instead of Lorenzo, maybe I just do a brief comment also regarding and linking maybe the two questions, education and the gentrification problem, issue. Uh, that somehow uh, the relationship with the senses and uh, there is a and, and also with folio. There was a, a Portuguese writer called Almeida Garret that wrote uh, in a book called uh, Travels Around My Country or Around My Land. He wrote, uh, he starts the book with a, a sentence saying that the most important trips he did in his life, or the most important traveling, he did it in his own room, in his own private room. So maybe, and that's eventually the role of the senses, and uh, how to play, how to somehow use them to improve education and to avoid gentrification eventually, is if people uh, are somehow invited or stimulated to increase their uh, imaginary density, and that comes from the senses, then maybe they don't need to travel so much to go somewhere just for a little while to consume uh, an image and then come back. And so avoiding uh, the problems related with gentrification and somehow would also enrich their own personality and uh, helping them by this kind of uh, education to uh, respond to that. Can I just add something, given the building, the city NGO that you've created between you? I mean, the, the reality is, I, 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 in a little book I wrote, and I said, Lisbon is the next Berlin, Athens is the next Lisbon. When cities become fashion items and mobility is so easy, people are always chasing whatever the new thing is. And of course, those places that have a deep history are always the one that get eaten up first. So, not surprisingly, Berlin, because of that specific history, but then, of course, Lisbon, a deeper history in some sense, and Athens too. So, there's always this search, this search for the new. And what I think the project about building the city is about in Lisbon, and then also Porto, because now more and more I keep on hearing, oh, yeah, have you discovered Port a Porto yet? You know, so then the second layer of cities becomes another one of these fashion items, is, is really the task of a combination of uh, civil, civic society and others, other interest groups, 
to, to really begin this discussion about what is this other city? Because in the work I've been doing, I, I've lived in Berlin for a bit now, just for the moment, and looking from a helicopter perspective at all the projects that people are trying to do from guerrilla gardening to parking day, restaurant day, all these sparks that are coming from below, what you feel and see is this deep yearning, desire, for another city, another city that operates on different principles. But the problem is, as we know, classic divisions, left, right, and all of that, don't exist in the same way. So the question is, how do we find, back to your favorite word, narrative, a story that feels compelling, that makes people feel they want to act? That is incredibly easy for me to say, that sentence, of course, but very difficult to do. But that is, I think, our collaborative agenda, to work that through. And it is ultimately about incentives, I think, and rules, both, you know, the positive and the more constraining. Boa tarde, eu vou perguntar em português, ok? É, eu moro em Lisboa já há algum tempo, mas sou de São Paulo e acompanho o que acontece é, na cidade por amigos e pela imprensa e soube que há um projeto em andamento na cidade para o centro de São Paulo está um pouco degradado, está bastante degradado, aliás, e há um projeto para a construção de grandes edifícios naquela região, para principalmente estimular a moradia popular para pessoas de baixa renda, e de forma que se aproveite a infraestrutura do, da região, com transportes e é, é, empresas né, que empregam grande parte das pessoas dali. E, para mim, isso é... O meu sentimento é ruim. A construção de grandes edifícios numa área histórica, que, para mim, deve ser restaurada e mantida é, de outra forma, para mim é ruim. Mas eu ouço pessoas, arquitetos e pessoas com mais conhecimento que eu, eu não sou arquiteta, não, não tenho muito conhecimento de arte, que estimulam e acham bem. E eu, eu fico confusa e queria saber qual a opinião de vocês a respeito disso, como conciliar o, o, a questão social numa grande cidade como São Paulo e essa, a questão da beleza, da harmonia, da arte, talvez? Não, mas eu acho que a pergunta é sobre como podemos desenvolver social housing em harmonia, em áreas uh, areas ou históricas, com harmonia, com qualidade, com beauty, também, porque às vezes Uh, the constraints existing from the financial economic point of view uh, somehow condition the, the, the design. I think, João, you may have something to tell us about that. We have made, okay? yeah. we have made uh, for the last 100 years in Portugal for the last 40 years in Brazil, probably before or after that too, most of the social housing buildings, uh, social housing neighborhoods in a very modernist way. It's simplified to say that, of course, but uh, some of them with fine architecture, with wonderful architecture, even here in Portugal too. Uh, the issue then was to provide housing for the people. The, the issue now should be how to provide habitat for the people, not only housing, but habitat. That's much more difficult, but much more interesting too. And uh, some, for instance, in, in around Lisbon, we have made huge social neighborhoods outside the city without one single bus to go there, for instance. And now there are problems in those, and it's very difficult to tackle with those problems. Uh, you, have, you, have seen, you, have, you have that in Spain, in France, in Italy, Offshore, of course, in Brazil, the, to, to, to make the transformation for, from housing to habitat, including housing, of course, because housing has become, again, a serious issue, not only for the poor, but for the medium class with gentrification, for instance, in Lisbon, particularly, but not only. That's part of the issue that we have to transform it to see the city in a very uh, tissue-specific way. The, the, 
the, the, the programs and the politics shouldn't be only about a specific territory, but about a specific, not a specific, but a, a thematic, to put social housing around the entire city, to make the politics much more transversal. It's very difficult. We have made for the last 200 years uh, uh, our institutions is the cultural department, is the housing department, is the, the transport department, even uh, us, no? Uh, I'm a geographer, not an architect or an economist. Or a, It's very difficult. We are all in containers. And now we have to work in a transversal form because the city is by nature transversal. Uh, so uh, that transversal politics must be filled in, in inside the politics and institutions. If the institutions are not prepared for that, so they should be. It should be dismantled in some way. That's going to be, of course, a phase in every revolution. This, the topic of the folio is revolution. In every revolution, any revolution, there is a moment of cracking down, but then with new ideas and innovation, it goes up again with a, a new era. Some of the revolutions don't work. Some work very badly, as we know. So it's important to go in the democratic way, and also with this. No? So to transform the classical modernist, including budgeting, financing, taxation systems, etc., in a much more transversal form. We should go that way. The, the longer that we start with that, the painful it will be. But it's going to happen, I'm sure. That, in that sense, I'm optimist. Any more? Uh, I Come. think, may I? Yes, please. Um, I would like uh, you to reflect a little bit on this uh, topic of uh, gentrification. Uh, the topic that has the umbrella of gentrification because it's a much more, it's a deeper problem. Um, and this uh, issue of Sao Paulo is, is linked with this. Gentrification um, has different facets. I'm talking about the one in Portugal that we know, and we can just uh, look uh, here in Obidos. What happens is that two-thirds of the village is empty. Two-thirds of the city, of the center of the city of Caldas next to here is empty. To, uh, the center of Lisbon up to 15 years ago was empty. The center of Porto of people, empty of people. The city of Porto, the center city of Porto was empty until five years ago when um, renovation started. So what the mechanism is, um, it, at the beginning it was not, it was expensive. It was just that the houses were derelict and there was no money to renovate them. That is one issue. The other issue was that the middle classes didn't like to live in the center of the city because facilities are not as good as they imagined they would like, which is to have a parking space and uh, some more space in their apartments and uh, you know all sorts of things that our rationalized Western thinking convinced them that were good. Air and space and bigger apartments and a car near your apartment and so on. So this is a very complex issue that is not solved by saying the poor people just left the center of the cities. That's not what happened. You know, they left because they wanted to. You know, here is, you know, the, the leftovers from that thing, what will happen probably in Obidus, the houses are being bought for people to convert, for foreign people, for instance, that like, and retired people that like to live here, or for people to having, you know, small hotels, Airbnbs, home aways, etc. But they are empty to start with. And though this is a mentality, that we developed, we architects, I mean we architects, urban planners, we developed uh, this mentality. 
And the issue in Sao Paulo is an issue that Europe faced 50 years ago. You know, we, 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 we built a lot of housing called social housing in a terrible way for after the war, um, especially after the war. It was a necessity because uh, cities where destroyed people had, and now for 20 years we have been demolishing them because they just don't work. They are, uh, so what is happening in Latin America is that they are going to do the same thing we did 50 years ago because they, they don't see an alternative. But the problem, and I, I'm, I think I have an answer for you, is be cautious, you should be cautious, because if you are destroying the central part of the city, it's the memory of Sao Paulo, it's a part of its identity in a new country, and when it's gone, it's gone. The social housing will be there, I'm sure it will be bad social housing, I'm sure it will have a lot of problems in uh, 10 years, but at least people will have a, a house and they will be nearer their workplaces, which I'm not sure anymore if they are in the center of town. So I would love you to comment on that. Thank you, Manuel. I, th I think that's uh, a comment or, or a question that could generate uh, a big conference around it or for a week or more. Okay, the short answer for me, I agree with you that gentrification is incredibly complex. It's positive up to a point and you need gentrification to make certain developments possible. The question is when it reaches a certain critical mass and so therefore the, the problem quite often is with policies or rules and regulations is that they're often there forever rather than being alert and I often say, I'm simplifying, uh, you need to be strategically principled and tactically flexible. So your strategic principle might be, I want a balanced community, just as an example. Str uh, tactically flexible might mean, in order to actually make something happen, I need to pump some money in and get some gentrification going. But the key point about this is the distinction between predict and provide planning, which you're talking about, to elastic planning. And elastic planning is a form of planning that is always alert. And then at certain thresholds, when certain critical mass points happen, when things are flipping in the wrong direction, you have to then re-intervene. And it's the problem about how regulatory systems work. I mean, that's only one partial thing. But what you were talking about is the meaning of life. And so it's very difficult to <laughs> say so, too much. Uh, I think we, this session is going very well and very interesting. And it's, but it's becoming a bit long. So maybe we should uh, continue our conversation around the table with a glass of wine. Uh, before that, I would ask uh, our panel to make a final statement, if you a closing statement, if you have, please. Lorenzo. Surely, Lorenzo, you've got a final statement. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, l let's, let's uh, make an effort after going away from this room trying to use again our nose and uh, discovering some smells that... Only the nose? Uh, only the nose. No, of course not. <laughs> I'm pushing from my side. Yeah, you should. Um, so I think life would, 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 would be much more funny and emotional if we use more our senses and if we give more importance to the, to the sense of sound, the sense of smell, the sense of touch. It's so important too. So that's it. Let's try to, to discover again what we have around us. Thank you. Thank you to our guests. Before, just uh, to end up, I would like to invite everyone for uh, an event that we'll have at 5.30 at Tower of Manej, Torre de Manej. Uh, there will be a, a session with Charles Landry uh, called Meet the Master. The idea is to have... Master is a bit too fast. <laughs> or Meet the King. No, uh, no, or something like this. And the idea is to have a, 
um, intimate conversation among friends with Charles Landry. So you are all invited. It would be a pleasure to see you there. Thank you very much, everyone.